Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to get, um, I think, started here just because we're already a couple minutes behind and we got a lot to cover. Um, so, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, uh, you know, on, on behalf of the uh, HFSA Early Career Committee, um, we or thought we'd put together uh, some uh, guidance to help and advice on as as uh, many of you are about to embark on the art failure job search, whether that be upcoming this summer or you know in the next few years. Um, so this kind of our HFSA mentoring webinar, preparing for your first job. Uh, to start, we're just going to go around for the panelists. Um, they're going to do just a brief introduction about who they are, where they work, and just a kind of quick blur about about some um, nuances to their job search. Um, so I'm just going to, I'll just start how they're listed on my screen. So Spencer, you're going to have you go first. Hey, I'm Spencer Carter. I'm at the University of Utah now. I did my training down in Dallas, Texas at uh, UT Southwestern. Um, my job search was pretty broad, mostly Midwest and West, uh, but I was pretty open to geographic areas, um, but definitely wanted a transplant job. Great, awesome. And then next I have uh, Vanessa. Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Bloomer. I'm originally from Venezuela. Um, so I came here on a J-1 visa, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, I did my residency and a chief year at University of Miami, then did cardiology training at Duke and then advanced heart failure at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and then I am currently at Inova um, and very happy to be here. Um, I, it was, it was, I think job search was very interesting for me and probably one of the most difficult things, um, I think, compared to fellowship and residency and, and other type of searches that we kind of do in the past. Um, but for me, priorities were definitely kind of staying in, in an academic um, role, but also an institution that allowed me to still have very high clinical standards. Those were kind of my priorities. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Akash? Hey everyone, uh, I'm Akash Rusia. I did my heart failure fellowship at University of Chicago with Mark, and uh, um, I was uh, I'm currently a heart failure uh, uh, sorry heart failure cardiologist at the Baylor Scott and White Heart Hospital in Plano, Texas. Um, my search was really laser focused on location. My wife is already a cardiologist in the Dallas area, and so I was really just laser focused on trying to find a heart failure job in the DFW area. Awesome, thanks, Chase. Yeah, hey everyone, I'm uh, Chase Stroud. I'm a heart failure PH cardiologist here at Oklahoma Heart Institute in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I did my training at University of Arizona and then my heart failure training at um, at Cornell in New York. Um, and uh, I was pretty broad uh, in my job search, but ultimately kind of wanted to stay in the Midwest. So this was a good fit. Thank you, Rachna. Hi. Uh, my name is Rachna Kataria. So I'm also from India originally, came uh, to the States on a J1. Job search was similar to Vanessa's. We've talked about it a lot. Uh, it was not interesting in my opinion, uh, very limited. Uh, my priorities were also academic. Um, and I'm at Brown University now. Uh, we have an affiliation with Tufts Medical Center, which is where I get my uh, bad and transplant rounding done at. But we'll talk more about that. Awesome, thanks. Sarah? Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. I see some familiar faces, Michael. So I know you already have a job, but thanks for being here. Um, and uh, yeah, I, um, I'm from DC. I did everything at Northwestern from medical school through heart failure fellowship um, in Chicago. And I'm now a heart failure attending there. So I can speak to um, that scenario if you have stayed in one place forever and you maybe want to stay. Um, and I spend uh, almost 40% of my time at the VA um, where I direct our heart failure program. I'm also 20% uh, one of our internal medicine residency APDs. Um, and then the rest of my time is uh, clinical at Northwestern. Um, so nice to see everyone. Awesome. Thanks for coming, Sarah. Uh, Shashank? Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm Shashank Sinha. I'm an advanced heart failure transplant cardiologist at Inova with Vanessa. Um, I did my cardiology and advanced heart failure transplant training at University of Michigan, go blue, and uh, would love to chat with you guys more about um, my search. It was very broad, uh, coast to coast. At the time, I was single and unattached, so I applied to dozens of programs and uh, can walk you through what that process looks like. Awesome. Thank you. And and Shank chairs our early career committee also. He left out. And then last but not least is uh, Yoni. 
Hey everyone, I'm Yoni Nativ. I'm an advanced heart failure transplant cardiologist at USC uh, in Southern California. Um, I did my training at uh, Cedar Sinai, um, and my search uh, for jobs was focused on California and the Chicagoland area. Uh, my wife's from Chicago, so uh, we're trying to be close to family. Um, and as a result, I casted a little bit of a wide search, a wide net, but I was really trying to hone in on an advanced uh, uh, therapy center. Uh, so I found myself here where I did my training prior to that. Awesome. Thanks, Yoni. And so thanks, panel, for being here. And especially thank you, everyone who's uh, here to listen. So we're going to start with the first question. Uh, and this may be for Vanessa and Sarah. And this is, uh, when did you start uh, looking for a job in relation to when you matched and when you started Advanced Fellowship? Start with Vanessa. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a good question because I always tell people that you can't, it's, you can it's never too early to start looking for, for a job. I think, especially if you have some geographic constraints, I think you should start reaching out to the programs that you're interested in, especially if you know where you're interested in sooner rather than later. Um, for me, because I was interviewing for Advanced Heart Failure Fellowship, there were some programs that I kind of started having some conversations in that interview trail. So I was in cardiology fellowship, applying for Advanced Heart Failure Fellowship, and then conversations had already been started um, either by myself, just kind of starting asking if, if they were going to have jobs available or the programs were asking me if I would be interested to stay after fellowship for a job. Um, so that's probably the earliest that I started having conversations. And then I didn't really have more serious conversations and still until I started my advanced heart failure fellowship at Cleveland. But I would say it was pretty early. Um, like I started in July and already in July, I was having some conversations. And then specifically to Inova, which is ultimately what where I came, I was fortunate enough that um, HFSA was in DC that year. So I traveled to ANOVA before HFSA to interview. Um, and then I can't stress enough how important HFSA is in general um, for a job search um, when you guys are applying. Be interested to hear your opinion, Sarah, as well. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. I mean, I feel like we're a little bit juxtaposed because I was you know, I've done everything at the same institution and um, I was interested in staying where I was, but still the advice was to apply broadly and that you need, you know, offers for leverage and et cetera, which I'm sure um, we'll get into. But yeah, agree summer um, of Heart Failure Fellowship, like July. And I remember being like very caught off guard when someone uh, told me that that was the timeline, but I agree it's never too early, especially because I feel like programs are growing, things are very fluid, and you might have a conversation with someone in July and they'll say, you know, there's not really any opportunities here, but then you've sort of planted the seed, you've gotten to know them, you've told them your interests, and if you keep following up, I mean, it's not annoying. Um, I think it's helpful if you ping them again in a few months and just say, like, just wondering if anything opened up or maybe they'll reach out to you, because again, I do think like programs are really expanding and we could talk about, you know, to the different types of models that there are, um, but uh, long story short is agree summer. Yeah. Perfect. That, that's very helpful. And kind of, and then leading off of that, um, so both of you, even, you know, whether it's staying or going, we're talking about um, starting in the summer, which is just coming up in a couple of months as you guys are all starting fellowship. So something kind of plan ahead for, and then kind of Chase and Spencer, um, kind of, uh, did, did you cold call people, cold email people? Did you rely on warm introductions? Um, start with you, Spencer. Yeah, so I, I did a mix of cold calling or cold emailing um, and warm introductions. Um, everyone knows everyone in the community. It's such a small uh, community in heart failure. So, so expect that yeah. people um, who uh, you're talking to will reach out to your program directors, et cetera. So make sure that you've had a conversation with your own leadership before you start reaching out or else it's a very awkward kind of conversation. And so, you know, as soon as you get to your fellowship, if it's a new place or even before your fellowship, sit down and have that conversation with your program director and the leadership at the institution, particularly if you are hoping or potentially staying of, hey, here's what I'm interested in. Who do you know? Um, and then, you know, keep your eyes open. Certainly, there's jobs that are posted on the Internet, um, you know, uh, uh, through a variety of things like the HFSA job board, but others but there are a lot of jobs that aren't. And so you won't know about them unless you start reaching out. And so that's certainly where your contacts are particularly helpful in your institutional contacts. 
So I think just really open communication with your own program um, and obviously your own network is, is key, uh, particularly at the start, just so uh, your expectation, their expectations um, are on the same page and, and really don't hurt feelings. Because um, it certainly can happen uh, if you start reaching out and then, you know, your program director is like, I thought you were staying. And, you know, they, they found out you were talking to places all over the country. Yeah, I would I would echo what Spencer said there. Um, for the most part, I relied on warm introductions. And <clears throat> the place where I'm ultimately at now, you know, the critical care team, one of their physicians I went to medical school with. So even though this institution was a little bit unfamiliar, I knew someone that was there and was at least familiar with the kind of the shock protocol and stuff. So I think warm introductions are 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 a little bit uh, I, I thought were more high yield, I guess I would say. Um, having said that, if you're really interested in an area that you would like to practice, I think just looking at hospital systems there and contacting them and seeing if they're open to starting a heart failure program, depending on how adamant you are about doing transplant, et cetera, and advanced therapies, it's also a good idea. I think it's really amazing, uh, Chase, to your point of, you know, you, you join a program um, in July you know, if they like you in that first month of how willing they are to go out on a limb and, and make those introductions, the people who you're working for, um, and they are really your advocates. They brought you there for a reason um, and will use their own network and resources to help you. Um, so again, having that conversation early and then um, obviously honing in, depending on if you have geographic or other restrictions and then which type of job you would like. Great points. And I think just to clarify for folks, I, I think, um, you know, as Spencer said, talking to your leadership first, I wouldn't be too afraid about, you know, even if you're in a situation where they really want to keep you, you want to stay there. Almost, you know, every situation is different. A lot of academic centers, usually you kind of have to fight for positions. So even if they're looking to keep you, a lot of imagine program directors are going to say that that's fine. Like, let's build leverage, you know, even if so. My point is, I don't think they'll be offended if you say I need to cast wide net. And also most places, no one can really guarantee you kind of job until they get it, no matter how much they like you. And and your program director will understand that. Will we'll understand that. Will you're continuing. Um, or, um, or, or you're somewhere new. Um, thanks guys for, uh, for those answers. Um, and then I think, I don't think we have time to, for everyone to talk about it, but I know other people on the panel have mentioned, you know, your program director is asking them to, or Spencer has just said kind of early on, reach out for you and, and help out as you're, as you're sending out emails. Um, you don't even ask the next questions for you guys. Um, you guys both did advanced heart failure fellowship training different from where you did, uh, general cardiology fellowship. So kind of piggybacking off of this, what advice would you give regarding kind of discussing jobs and letters with your new program director? Sure, I, I can go first. Um, so, um, you know, I was at Cedars for one year. Um, so it was definitely a, a new landscape, but uh, this was actually nice that the program leadership at Cedars um, kind of went out of their way to establish a meeting with us right at the beginning of the year, I think literally in the first week of our fellowship training, just to kind of get a sense of um, where we're interested in jobs geographically, what kinds of jobs. Um, and um, you know, literally after that meeting, I think Michelle Kittleson and Kabashi Gala just like emailed everybody that they knew at each of those respective geographic areas. And like Kittleson gave me answers within 24 hours of which institutions were hiring, which ones were not. So that kind of helped hone my search. Um, and then um, on this uh, outside of that, I um, similarly had like a few warm introductions, which were helpful. Um, and uh, uh, but I think that establishing a meeting early on, whether or not your program is uh, arranging that, um, or if it's something that you sort of request, um, just to kind of set some ground rules or expectations of what is going to come of your uh, one year one year fellowship training, because it, it goes by very quick. And before you know it, you're job hunting. Um, I didn't start my job search as early, but I did. I kind of waited till after my general cardiology boards were done. So I really kicked it into high gear um, around uh, like middle of October. Um, and it kind of was getting a little bit of a lay of the land before then. Awesome. Vanessa? Yeah, I can comment a little bit on that. Um, and I think it might be a similar experience. I didn't have a formal meeting like that, but I think they were in incredibly supportive. I think it's always a balance between them wanting to also kind of recruit you and keep you, but also wanting what's best for you. And I think at the Cleveland Clinic, they also did that 
beautifully. Um, I think they had very open conversations with all of us in terms of where we wanted to go, what we wanted for our career, and kind of told us where prior graduates had gone to, um, ran through options with us of what was out there. Um, and then we're also incredibly supportive and were very open um, in terms of also wanting to keep us if, if, if that was our choice. Um, so, I mean, I encourage everyone to have very open conversations with leadership in their programs. And, and, and in my case, that that was that went well. Um, and, and so I want one more thing to add. I think it's also very important as you're creating your rank list for programs to keep in mind like who you're who's going to be advocating for you and helping you find a job. Um, you know, even like within like I was mentioning before, like I was focused on uh, California, like Los Angeles and Chicago, like even within um, um, L.A., um, which has a few programs, I had to kind of think about, well, who's going to have the most notoriety or the best uh, sort of connections um, and kind of help uh, prioritize my listing. Definitely. So in, in both cases, definitely, you know, think about the network um, and, um, and, and use the network. Don't be afraid to use your program director, you know, and the, they're there to advocate for you, not just to train you, but to get you the next step. And they're all they're all aware that everyone who comes through needs a job next year. So you're, you're not surprising them. You're, you're not their fellow forever. So make sure to use that and do that early. Um, thanks, Yoni, Vanessa. Um, uh, we're going to the next question. So um, this one's for Akash and Rachna. Um, you guys are both looking for jobs um, specifically in a different city from where you trained um, in, in slightly different um, situations, as, as they kind of briefly mentioned. Uh, can you tell us more about how, how your job search process went? I'll start with you, Rachna. Uh, sure. So I think mine was a unique experience in the sense that the timeline's extreme. It's it's different. Uh, you have to start searching for a job when you're kind of finishing up cardiology fellowship, and you have to have it locked in October of uh, your heart failure fellowship, which is it basically overlaps with your boards. So those few weeks were just awful. Um, and so it was between April uh, of cardiology fellowship. And then by October, I had my job. Uh, I was for fellowship. I had a choice. I wanted to go to the program that interested me the most that got me excited, which was at MGH. But I knew for sure that they would have no idea how the visa process worked. And I was right. Uh, so I get there. I speak with a few people. They have no idea how this visa works. Um, and so I think leveraging my cardiology fellowship going to meetings like ACC, HFSA, and using the HFSA, ACC website uh, search, job search was extremely helpful. Uh, and then I would just filter that out, you know, uh, based on visa. And then I think more than that, just, you know, meeting people and creating or building your networks at these meetings was extremely helpful when it came to job search. So word of mouth is, uh, is something that worked uh, for me. And then in terms of geography, I think I was looking broadly I could not restrict myself. Um, so I looked broadly and then I was also not only focused on the university centers, but also places that had networks or hybrid jobs, um, you know, because that that those seem to be the majority of jobs these days. Um, so but just looking for an interesting role that would allow for academic involvement, but also building something in the community. And it worked out well. So, yeah. Perfect. Yep. And then we have a later question coming up, talking more about kind of the the, the, the job specifically. And then Akash, um, you can also comment. I think um, Mason asked in the chat about coordinating kind of the job search with a partner. It was a little bit. You guys were one year off, but that's yeah. Your... Yeah, exactly. My my wife was a cardiology fellow in the same class, and so she had already gotten started her job while I was a heart failure fellow. And so I knew I needed to go to Dallas. So I tried to be a little bit systematic about it. I looked for, you know, first there's three transplant centers. There's two DT VAD centers. And then there was a whole sort um, whole bunch of uh, non bad transplant heart failure jobs that I just kind of found using an internet search, and they're mostly non academic centers. And so um, overall, I think a combination of just cold emailing uh, doctors or physician recruiters, but um, but really the thing that helped the most was just using, as everyone has said, using connections at your heart failure fellowship. And so the folks at U Chicago, you know, Mark included, were really helpful and. Uh, reached out to the folks they knew at all these centers, and um, um, I think that was by far and away the most effective thing that helped. So, um, yeah, and I think that geography was, um, I was fortunate. I think that, you know, not as many, not all cities have five, six different 
heart failure jobs and in, in different centers in, in the same city. So I was at least blessed with the DFW area being so booming, basically. Awesome. And then, um, you know, I think um, for the panels, we'll go a little bit out of order just because um, uh, Akash and Rosh kind of were, were talking about this. And we have another question for them, which is at, at this point, based on the job search we've discussed, you guys are working at a non-transplant center directly um, and kind of part of a hybrid network. Um, so I guess, you know, in terms of uh, I'd, identifying the job, the expectations you had and how kind of fellowship prepared you for that, what are some things you kind of learned in, in your first couple, first year, for second year on the job? I think personally, I think it's fun. I feel like you can innovate. Um, you know, you're not uh, taking on a role that's kind of uh, set in stone. You can do different things with it, uh, but you have to be open-minded and you have to like, have you guys heard of that? Like a black dot on a white sheet of paper and everyone just looks at the black dot. You have to look at all of that white space and what you can make of it. Um, which you constantly have to remind yourself. So, I'm, you know, not to sound like this old wise woman, but you have to remind yourself, like there's all that white space and you can make uh, whatever you wish out of it. So for instance, I'm interested in cardiogenic shock and this was a great opportunity. So Rhode Island is the size of a postage stamp, right? So trying to build something in that state was um, was exciting. Uh, and then, but then you realize that you're a non-bad, non-transplant center. So you're probably dominated by the interventionalists. So then you have to kind of learn how to navigate that. So it's like, it's learning at every stage and it really depends on, you know, your attitude towards it. Um, there's other things, um, other niches like cardio-oncology, which is really big um, with our cancer center booming. Um, so that's something else that I'm building on, uh, which has been quite exciting. But I think that's what I like about the role is I do get to go to Tufts and I do get to round on inpatient beds and transplants. But I also feel like Heart Failure Fellowship prepared me to find and pick and choose those people in the community that would benefit from making that trip to Boston because people of Rhode Island do not like to drive more than 10 minutes. So all of those things I think I thought were very exciting for me um, to sort of learn from scratch and, you know, build uh, upon what I had learned in fellowship. Yeah, um, you know, the group I went to was, uh, it's a VAD center. Uh, it's five of cardiologists including myself. And, um, you know, I, I think the first thing I did once I knew I was taking this job was go to my program director and say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to a non-transplant center, you know, and, and how can I optimize my own fellowship experience the rest of the way through? And so working closer with the surgeons, going into the OR much more often, you know, um, working with our bad coordinators and doing bad clinic more often. I, I think that was really helpful because the center I'm at is much more hands-on um, we don't have as big of a support staff. You know, our VAD coordinators aren't mid-levels, they're nurses. And so we pretty much have a much more active role. And so I think in every heart failure fellowship, you do have these opportunities to really tailor your education to your job. And I think that was really uh, uh, helpful. Um, and, and it kind of uh, improved my understanding and, and expertise going into uh, uh, this job. So that was really helpful. Um, I think... That, was there any other question? I forget. Well, I mean, I guess for both you, you know, now being in it, and again, you know, um, and I think this is part of what we've talked a lot as we're as as heart failure in the yeah. in, in your career. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. not everything is about transplant, and that there is so you know so much heart failure is outside of transplant, despite the focus on it for a lot of fellowship. Um, so I guess um, how has um, how do you feel kind of working now where you're not you know directly doing transplants? How is that translated? I can chime in a little with this too. Um, I do feel like, so I I can talk about the VA in a little bit, but um, I spend like half my clinical time at the VA, um, which doesn't have VAD and transplant. I spend a lot of my time referring for VAD and transplant at Northwestern, but I do think during training, during fellowship, we have so much exposure to inpatient medicine, ICU. We're very unfamiliar, at least my experience. And I think this is sort of global with like outpatient medicine. I hated clinic. Um, prior to becoming an attending, I found it very overwhelming. And now I just love it so much. It's just different when it's your own patients, when it's your own clinic, um, when you know the people coming in. Um, and so I do think like keeping an open mind um, about that is really important. And I find outpatient medicine, honestly, like 
a lot more interesting now than inpatient medicine. Um, there's so much more variety, um, especially if you're in kind of more of a community program or a VA program where you're the amyloid person, the sarcoid person, you know, the dilated cardiomyopathy person. And so um, I wouldn't like discount, I wouldn't think of yourself as not wanting to do that. Keep an open mind. Yeah. I agree with Sarah a hundred percent. Sorry. Um, yeah. I have started to like, I, you know, outpatient medicine so much more than I did when I was a fellow. And, and when people would ask me about, you know, do you just want to prescribe GDMT? It would piss me off a little bit, but like actually seeing those patients get better is so exciting. It really is. It's not just that it's exciting on, not just on Twitter, but it is in real life, uh, seeing those EFs recover and then all of the workup for cardiomyopathy and then sort of helping, you know, make a plan to risk stratification with right heart cats, CPETs, all of that. Uh, temporary MCS, like there's so much to do um, before you get to that point of heart, you know, of transplant and that. And those patients do come back to us, so we get to manage them post op. But I, I just, I just still uh, love everything that comes first. Um, yeah, I think that it was sad to kind of give away the the post transplant world. Um, but overall, I think that the reason I went into heart failure was more of the cardiomyopathies, the shock patients, those interesting really sick patients. And so while it was tough, I think that it opened up a little bit more opportunities to kind of grow into to learning more about LVADs and, and cardiomyopathies. And um, I did kind of learn actually on the interview trail that these, you know, in a hub and spoke system, these spoke programs are so crucial. Um, I think I was quoted something like, you know, half of uh, Baylor Dallas's transplants are referred by, not half, but a third are referred by our, by our program directly. And so I thought that was really, you know, unique in that I do have this attachment to a center. I may, may not be taking care of those transplants or doing those transplants, but um, I think I, I feel as like part of the team still and identifying these patients, working them up and um, referring them uh, when it's appropriate. So I think it's overall, I feel like I'm missing a little bit, but I'm okay with it. One thing I wanted to add also is that I think Akash had mentioned that, um, you know, you can really kind of, most programs allow you to really tailor your, 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 your experience and training, but also know that like, even if you don't master every piece of advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology or VAD cardiology in that one year, like that's okay. You know, like I um, am probably not that the volume at my current uh, job is that much different than what it was um in my place of training, but I'm just as a fa now as a faculty, I'm just more responsible for taking care of those patients more regularly. Um, and uh, you know, being on the West Coast, VAD is not um, as high in volume, so I was, wouldn't say that I was super comfortable with VAD care or um, kind of tweaking meds or hemodynamics or support in like a fresh VAD patient. But that's something that you also kind of. You, my point is, you continue to learn on the job too. <clears throat> so um, it truly is lifelong learning as they say. Um, so yeah, it's okay if you don't learn everything coming right out of training. I'll briefly echo what Sarah said that I also was not a fan of clinic. Um, our, our system was not set up with like continuity clinic with pros and cons that as a fellow. Um, but uh, once you have your own clinic and your own patients and you are, um, you know, either getting them better, making, you know, making their, their amyloid diagnosis or sarco diagnosis or helping them get towards their destination therapy, it is, um, definitely um, kind of a, a part of medicine that, you know, the operation medicine ends up being, I think, much better than training. I think a lot of people are, a lot of us are saying that, which is great. Um, and so kind of moving on then into, um, as you guys were looking at jobs, so this one, I'm gonna start with Chase, um, kind of differentiators between kind of academic and non-academic job opportunities. I know you looked at a lot of them um, and then Akash and Yoni as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I do think that the um, the difference was not as stark as you might think um, it, during your training. Um, and, uh, you know, at least I had a view of the private space as being more RVU driven, at least more procedural, you know, generating income. But all the private jobs I looked for mostly were salary based, um, almost a, most of them 100 percent salary. Um, I think the difference in academic and private is sort of your focus and where you see your career trajectory. If you're trying to shift your FTE, your full-time equivalents to teaching or research, then I think academics, you know, you want to have something built into your contract or at least have strong mentorship there. Um, if you're going into the private space and you're interested in a niche area, 
you may want to advocate for a directorship role and for instance, have something built into your contract where you have administrative reimbursement for your directorship duties, like 20 hours a month or something. So I think there's a lot of nuances to the differences in the positions, but ultimately I found the reimbursement kind of similar. It's just obviously the culture and the structure is different. And, and so just, just tailoring it to whatever you feel fits your needs, um, but just know there's a, a variety of jobs out there. Chase, who did you go to to talk about contracts since, you know, we tend to be in academic centers and only know academic people? Did you have a point of contact or how did you do that? Um, I actually had some friends that had um, entered the workforce a few years before me and sort of were like, hey, make sure you ask about this. And and sometimes you may not, you know, think about things until you hear um, what some of your friends or peers are negotiating or asking for, you know, certainly it's hard to get more reimbursement per RVU or something like that. And, and so there's certain things that you can actually negotiate for that are possible, like administrative hours or shifting your FTE equivalents if you're in an academic job um, year to year and stuff like that. So you know, just be open-minded, I think, with your negotiations. And really, you know, if you're going to an area, like I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? I mean, it's not uh, New York City. So um you have a little bit more leverage, the more kind of chance you're willing to take on location and infrastructure. And so just know that as an applicant. Yeah, just using DFW as an example in terms of like the non-academic versus academic split. So um, there's a hospital here that does 2030 transplants and it's a fully private non-academic center. Um, and I remember talking to a few folks in their group and um, it felt like a very private practice hustle kind of job. And that's exactly what, you know, those folks were looking for. They're, um, you know, reading echoes, going to clinic, doing procedures, seeing patients in the hospital all in the same day. And um, they're going home and reading more echoes, right? And so, um, and I, you know, I, don't, I never really figured out what the pay was, but I'm guessing that they're driven by, you know, RVU production. And so um, it, it all kind of depends on what you want. If you want that, then that's absolutely, you know, um, um, out there. There was another non-academic job and um, it was a bad center and, and they, uh, it was, uh, I would be the third out of, you know, and they're in a bad center. And so, you know, you want to kind of think about your call schedule a little bit and, and that kind of sometimes the non-academic life, you're going to be uh, working a little bit harder and, and maybe there is a financial reward. I never really got to figure that out, but um, it was something where I felt like you're kind of on your own in some, some respects. And so, and so I felt like, um, uh, currently, I'm at a kind of more private center. We do have a fellowship, um, very impressive fellow. Some of them who are on today on this on this webinar, and uh, um, I think it makes it really fun. And uh, I'm really glad that I didn't do it. But at the same time, um, I know a lot of my friends who fully would have engaged in in, in a non academic job. So there are they are out there. Um, some of them maybe you can make your own schedule and uh, have a little bit more flexibility, but um, that wasn't the case in the Dallas area, unfortunately. <laughs> and and then I guess could um, I guess comment in regards to what I think both a little bit from my experience, but also talking to all of you, um, that kind of the two, um, I guess, what would you caution people are looking at non-academic jobs in regards to um, whether it be, I think there's a one of kind of the um, workload, you know, are you kind of, are, are you, is it more general cardiology and with kind of plus the heart failures thing, uh, directorships, those kinds of things um, that were offered and, and and what your thoughts are or experiences with those. And if I may add to that, I don't know if you guys, uh, if you came across a lot of like come build the MitraClip program or help us start a DT VAD. Do you guys come across that when you were looking at non-academic and what, what, what you, it, it's tempting, but what went through your minds or like, what did you end up finding if you interview with someone? Um, I mean, my personal experience was I, I am horrible at administrative things. Um, I'm very disorganized. And so starting a VAD program would be like my nightmare with uh, DNV and uh, JCO and things like that. Um, so when I was looking for a private place, uh, I wanted to make sure that the infrastructure was already there. Um, I'm the director of pulmonary hypertension. And so, um, you know, I made sure that I had something about having two pH coordinators to, for prior loss and things like that and structure wise. Um, and we already had an established VAD program. So I, I think just playing to your strengths. I mean, if you're a very 
uh, organizational administrative person, I think it's possible, but it's really a lot of heavy lifting to try to establish an LVAD program. I um I established an invasive CPAP program and I'm I'm psyched about that. <laughs> we get to do that and that's a lot of fun, but um it was not near as much building as would be required for something like an LVAD program. So, you know, um that that's that's a little bit of caution, I think, if you're trying to really try to build a huge kind of program like that with little infrastructure, I'd be really nervous about that job. Yeah, I completely agree with Chase. Um, I came across a similar experience where it's, it feels so easy on paper, like to start a program, you know, you can be your own boss and, and, and design the program, hire the people that you want. And uh, it sounds nice. The money usually is, a, you know, very tempting, but um, just looking at my own center, like the folks that started and built our group, I mean, they were working probably a hundred hours a week for two, three years to just to kind of continue to work very hard and have to continually grow the group. And so it is um, something that I think you just need to make sure you're built for. And uh, definitely a lot of heart failure fellows are, are super ambitious and, and um, you know, willing to put in that work and, and maybe that's their dream. But um, I think for, for most folks, it's, it's just easier said than done. Uh, the one, the one like other thing, oh, sorry. The one other thing I would just say is, is if you're going to the private space, and you're tasked with an LVAD program or something like that, you know, the other thing to look at is the ECMO program and see if that is functional and what's going to be involved in building that. So that's another thing, obviously. I was just going to reflect, like, I feel like what you guys are saying is um, very true, which is that like, we made it, this is, we're adults now with a real job and there's not really anyone to impress anymore, you know? So just know yourself and know your strengths and what you like. And if you're not passionate about academic medicine, like don't do that. Um, and I feel like we get a lot of pressure, um, you know, from within our training programs to stay in academics, but like it is your life. And, um, you know, if you need like a free, our Northwestern offers like free career coaching for um, trainees. So like, if you need someone like that to kind of help you figure out what you truly want to do, I feel like that's very useful. And, and I'll just, I'm, I'm trying to be conscious of time, but I also want to do kind of like a brief comment. I think we've been kind of taught to look at things as academic and non-academic, where I think that there's, especially in heart failure, there's a lot of options that are very hybrid. Um, and I consider ANOVA to be that, you know, I don't think ANOVA is academic or non-academic. I think, I mean, call it hybrid or private or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I don't think that I'm missing out on academic medicine at all. Um, if actually, I think I have a lot of more protected time for academic medicine within ANOVA than I had at other institutions. And I think it's valued a lot more. So I don't think that the fact that you go into non traditionally non academic institutions mean that you're isolating yourself from academic. I think, you know, echoing Sarah's if it's true to your values, and that's something that you want to continue doing, you'll do it regardless of where you are. You just have to make sure that it's a value of the institution of where you're going, you know, and I think that applies to Cedars and it applies to Cleveland Clinic, which are still institutions that traditionally are not purely academic institutions, but are some hybrid or somewhere in between. So uh, I just don't think that it's it's a binary, right? It's not. Um, there's there's a spectrum in these institutions. One uh, sorry, uh, just uh, real quick, just to move on a little, Yanni, but I just to tie to one of our questions. Um, Shashank, you were someone who who left fellowship and and has have, have built a uh, great cardiac shock critical care center at Inova. Um, do you have any kind of advice if, if, if people are planning on taking on early on early directorial uh, roles? Yeah, absolutely. Don't do what I did. But um, <laughs> the uh, no, that's the short answer of it. Um, you guys deserve a more nuanced response. And, and I'll share it um, to build on sort of what Dr. Bloomer just mentioned. Uh, when I initially told my mentors that I was going to go to Inova, they're like, I thought you were serious about academics. And obviously I think five or six years later, that is definitely not the comment that I received from, from those same mentors. And so I think part of it is to really recognize that a lot of programs and especially COVID-19 really did do this and level the playing field. Um, you know, Historic programs can't rely on their reputation alone. And these emerging programs that really are the hustle and bustle that some others have referred to really can compete based on clinical uh, volume and value and merit uh, alone. 
Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of the opportunity I was given, uh, again, to put in a plug uh, for HFSA, it came through a speed mentoring event. Um, I actually was very interested in going to Duke at the time and uh, was advised by a number of mentors to go talk with people who had recently left there. So I went to go meet with my now boss, Chris O'Connor, who had just left uh, Duke a year prior to go to Inova to hear his thoughts about, and perspective about that. And he was waiting to talk with one of his former you know, faculty or fellows or alumni. And so uh, while we were sitting there, he was like, well, what are you interested in? Um, and so I expressed my interest in sort of cardiogenic shock and critical care cardiology and, and so on and so forth. And one thing led to another. And um, it turned out that Inova was hosting a heart failure shock symposium with now my mentor, Naveen Kapoor, at, as giving the keynote. So it was really um, a good example, I think, of structured serendipity. You want to show up to these events, uh, build uh, re relationships and rapport over time, and then hopefully, you know, good things will will happen. Um, that being said, when I took on a leadership role, you know, I was uh, humbled and honored to embrace that challenge. Um, I didn't feel prepared for it, even though I'd done sort of the, um, you know, ACC has a leadership academy and I'd done some other leadership development work during the course of my fellowship. So I actually took a mini sabbatical even before I started my first job. I visited 18 ICUs around the country, spent about a week at a time with each of them. So if you do the math, that's like four and a half months. Um, and I took my time to build a lifeline of CICU directors and establish some key research collaborations. You've heard of them now, but at the time they were in their infancy. So shock working group was one of them and critical care cardiology trials network was the other. Um, and both of them ended up being, you know, important mentors and collaborators of mine as I started to formulate my own vision. Um, one of the key challenges you'll run into if you're trying to build a program from scratch is that as soon as you arrive, you actually, if you're especially at an institution different from your own where you trained, you don't know the culture. And as the off-sided adage goes, culture eats strategy. And so it took me a good, you know, six months to a year to really understand, okay, what are the institutional strengths here? What is the status quo? Why are people wanting to do it this way? And, and really, you know, first seek to understand and then be understood, right, as, as we're taught. And so, um, you know, I, and then in my second year, there was this, you know, obviously once in a century pandemic that emerged and really rapidly uh, accelerated, I think, my leadership development. So... I definitely had this sort of trial by fire approach. It definitely, um, I, I'm incredibly grateful for it. I was very lucky to have a very supportive boss, uh, Chris O'Connor, and we had a lot of uh, transition, but we went from, uh, you know, a 20, 20, 25, 25 bad transplant program to like doing 60 or 70, you know, transplants within, you know, a matter of four or five years. And our shock program, you know, quadrupled in volume during that time. Um, and so it, it obviously, you know, takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of collaboration. Um, you, you, and that's why I have a lot of caution for people who are like, you're going to be the only attending or the first heart failure attending, and they're not hiring anybody else to support you. You're wearing a lot of hats and take it from everyone on this panel. I challenge anyone on this panel to say that the fellow to faculty transition wasn't hard enough because that first year, and no matter how skilled or gifted of a clinician you were, and I'm lucky to work with some of the best, um, uh, it's a humbling experience. It's the first time you're learning. And you really want to go to a place where I think that word culture is very strong so that you are getting mentorship, not only in terms of academics, if you're in an academic place, but more importantly, uh, clinical mentorship. Who are you going to call for help in the middle of the night when you haven't encountered a situation you didn't face in your training? Um, and, uh, and do you have the requisite support you need to kind of grow and develop in, in your skills? So really think about um, a five-year arc recognizing that um, more than 50% of people change their jobs after two or three years. So it's okay if you don't get it right the first time. Uh, but uh, I think having an open mindset, uh, I certainly never imagined that I would end up at ANOVA when I was initially starting training or even my heart failure fellowship year. Um, and it was a series of, of really very fortunate events for me that, that landed me here and it's been a, a wonderful learning experience. That's awesome, Shashank. Thanks for, for sharing your story and your advice. Um, I'm going to make a quick pivot because we have a couple of questions we want to get to and still leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so going back, I think um, Rasha and, and Vanessa both mentioned it. Um, we had talked about, um, you know, uh, the, um, the being able to call with visa um, uh, considerations. And so how did the visa considerations play into your uh, into your job search and eventually to the job you have now? Start with uh, Vanessa. I was going to let Rasmus talk first, since I feel like she was my mentor throughout this entire process, and then I can add to it. 
Oh God, I hate talking about this um, because the process is jarring. Like there's no, I, I'm not going to pretend. It, it's extremely isolating. Not a lot of people understand. Vanessa and I talked about it uh, pre ishlt uh, well, we're getting drinks and I think that's the best time to talk about this when you're a little bit drunk. Um, and, and it's just, it's like nice to get all those emotions out, you know, off your chest, but yeah, so extremely jarring, very isolating. And I, I think this could be a webinar in and of itself. So I'm happy to take specific questions from anyone on this, uh, anyone that's joined us today, feel free to reach out, but I'll just say, and I mentioned this previously, your search will probably start a few months before your peers, like a serious start search has to start in April or May of cardiology fellowship. And then you have to have your job locked in by October of uh, heart failure fellowship, which is the same time uh, that you take your boards. So you have to be extremely intentional about it. Uh, make use of your network, your contacts, um, just reach out. Uh, you never know who has this new you know, position, which will most likely be hybrid. Uh, but within a network that would be able to support your individual interests. So just keep like talking to people, be open about your visa situation. There's no point in like, you know, um, sort of not talking about it upfront and then just bringing that on someone that never helps. You're wasting your time. You're wasting their time. Just be, you know, open about that from the get go. Um, and, and yeah, I think my J1 <laughs> network helped. So make sure that you have yours. Um, it helps a little bit with the search process and also just, you know, helps, um, you know, kind of just like it, it helps to have friends in the same situation as you. Yeah, I, I totally concur with that. Um, I used to go around and I used to say that I was J1 positive and that it was a terrible disease to have. Um, the, the only difference was that it wasn't contagious, but it was it was terrible, ter terrible disease to have. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm grateful for for the people that I had that kind of gave me tips along the way and and, and including them, Rachna. I think if there's something that I learned a along the way and in the process is that there's no such thing as the perfect job. Like you're not going to find the perfect job. So you have to understand and recognize what are priorities for you and what are your non-negotiables. So the visa situation just adds another layer of complexity. So it's just one other thing. So is that something that for you, it's a non, is it a non-negotiable? Um, so if it is a non-negotiable, like Rachna said, you have to start very, very early because the majority of the programs need an answer by July, August, um, if not sooner. Um, for me, I think what I understood is that it was not a non-negotiable. My priority was finding a good fit for a job. I wanted a job that aligned with my values and that gave me the future that I wanted in terms for, of my professional career. And like Shashank was also saying, I wanted a team that I aligned with. And that was to me, my priority. But I think it's impossible for you to find a perfect job, either it be geography or where your family is or wanting the perfect academic thing or where your niche is or where the pay is or where they're gonna sponsor your visa, everything together. I mean, that unicorn job, I, I, I hope it's out there for everyone, but I would argue that it's probably not and you're gonna have to sacrifice something. So you have to decide what it is that you're gonna sacrifice. I was just excited extremely fortunate that for me it worked out because Innova is just a wonderful place and they made it work um so but I was late in the process for the visa uh and again just Innova somehow made it work but if J1 is a priority just to keep this short just you have to do it much earlier than everybody else and then reach out happy to answer questions and reach out to people that have J1s that have gone through the process because that's going to be crucial uh, thank you both for talking about that and and and, and helping inform our audience um, about that experience. Um, in terms of, I think, final question for um, before we move on to uh, questions from the audience, we can address those. Um, just kind of to the late stage, you apply for jobs, you've gotten them. Now you have multiple job offers. Maybe you got one from the one you weren't hoping to get one first that you're planning to use leverage. It's early in the process. Um, starting with Spencer, what advice would you give uh, in the multiple job offer situation? Maybe, yeah, maybe just to take a step back as far as kind of timing. So I started looking in July, August, September, used HFSA to have conversations um, and then started going on interviews. 
September, October, November. I was hoping to have kind of an offer somewhere uh, by end of December or January and have signs, um, though certainly some of my colleagues were maybe a little bit later. Uh, so much of this is chance, unfortunately. When jobs become available, um, kind of the timing within the, the context of, of what you're doing. Um, you really want to be thoughtful as far as jobs that you're interested in and when you schedule, if possible, uh, your interviews for them because you can have an exploding offer, you know, really where they tell you, hey, we need to know by the end of two weeks for us, we're giving the job to someone else. And if that's out of place, then maybe you haven't been able to explore all of your other options. It's really challenging. I think the biggest piece of all of this is just being open, honest, and straightforward. Hey, I'm interviewing at multiple places. I'm interested in multiple places. Here's a timeline that I see in my head as far as when I would like to sign by. Um, and you know that is within your own institution, but also kind of with the other institutions with whom you're negotiating, um, I think is, is really key. Um, this is alluded to previously, academic jobs are notoriously uh, a pain as far as actually getting them through a process. I think at Utah, there's uh, four different committees that it has to get approved by, it has to be funded, et cetera. And so these things just drag out and, and can take a, a long time. Um, so certainly, you know, uh, uh, hopefully the people that you're negotiating with, you can trust them on their word. And, and obviously, if you know people that know them, you can kind of get a sense of, of is that reality or not, which I think was really important when I was kind of in the middle of this. So it's really a, a challenge as far as an answer goes, because it comes, it comes quickly, and you are kind of juggling multiple things. I think, um, you know, so obviously this is our, many of our first job, really, first negotiated job, you know, my wife's in business and she's like 15 years into her career and she was just laughing at me about my inability or unwillingness to ask for things. And she's like, what are you doing? You know, you just need to ask. And I remember I was sweating, sending uh, a Jim Fang an email asking for, you know, 10% protected time for X, Y, and Z. And his response was a uh, thumbs up emoji. <laughs> and I had spent you know, 10 hours on this email, you know, just worried about it. And, uh, you know, he's like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> and so, you know, just realize the, the, you know, make sure you obviously what you're asking for is reasonable. Talk to the young faculty, understand where you're going and what you're able to negotiate someplace that's salary, someplace that's protected time, um, someplace that very strict salary. So just get an understand of, of you know, where uh, there's room on the negotiation side and then just be open, kind of honest and forthright. And in general, the places need you in addition to you needing them. Um, and so really kind of take that as a uh, uh, something that's comforting when you're kind of talking to multiple places at one time. Awesome. I think that that's very helpful. If um, anyone does have a, um, specifically or want to respond to that, um, we can maybe move on to some of uh, the questions from the chat. Um, I think, um, Mark, I think Michael, did you see Michael Hill's yes, question? I, that's actually what I was just scrolling up to. <laughs> To double check it. Um, hi, Mike. Thanks for being uh, uh, here. Um, and so um, you had a question kind of about kind of what is the spectrum of VAD and transplant time um, at various jobs? And if anyone, um, as they're looking for jobs, was offered, whether they were kind of a spoke, especially, I would say, um, outside of the hub, what time were you offered and what did you think was too little, too much? I think, I mean, Rashna, you're, you're both at Tufts and, and Brown, so maybe we can start with you. Sorry, I was actually reading the question that, so sorry, can you repeat what you just um, said? I basically, like, um, timing, you know, no, okay, when you're looking at jobs of how much time kind of being offered at the hub kind of VAD transplant center when you're, when your main job is at the spoke center and what was too Oh, much. yes, I did read so, that question. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that there's a magic number, to be honest. Um, right now, I'm actually only doing four weeks. So yeah, so in my opinion, that's not enough uh, if you must classify it. It's not enough. And I certainly, um, you know, have this like withdrawal for two weeks when I come back for, I, I miss it. Um, but I think as far as, you know, maintaining your skill set, you kind of tend to continue doing that because you're, you're taking care of the post fab transplant patients. So it's really the inpatient um, critical care rounding uh, that I'm not doing. And I think maybe it was the kind of fellowships that I had that I don't feel like I'm missing out, but I'm sure everyone has a different experience. But personally, for me, the four weeks works just fine. I feel comfortable when I go there. I don't feel like I'm catching up on inpatient care. Um, yeah, but I'm sure people have different experiences. I feel like some skills are just, I don't know, I'm, I'm like nervous being around the shock gurus, but I feel like cardiogenic shock, 
I can do that. Like, even if I do that a few times a year, probably not doing it as well as um, they do in Nova, but I feel comfortable. Um, transplant, I'm getting really rusty on because I don't, I just don't do it that much. Um, and I'm still going to do it because I enjoy it. But I definitely, when I do transplant clinic, I lean more heavily on other people. Um, like I'm more in touch with our transplant director. I'm looking more things up. Um, and so again, yeah, I don't think there's a magic number. It's just sort of like, you know, how you practice, um, and like what you have. All, to... all of transplant is voodoo magic, isn't it? So exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's like the confidence with you... which I say <laughs> you photophoresis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I can add to that too. I had a couple of job offers that were kind of like academically affiliated, but they were really kind of the focus of the job was to build out the spoke. Um, and I think that when offered those jobs, you have to kind of take a step back and be like, my job is the spoke. Am I okay with that? And like, I'm, there's like a, a hub kicker and it's really, you know, in my opinion, uh, uh, many times it's just like an enticing thing to kind of get you interested because they realize we're all coming from academic training and kind of naturally are academically, um, um, kind of gra gravitating towards that direction, but you really have to kind of make sure that you're okay with that being your job. And um, also, um, uh, you know, maybe kind of giving up some of that skill set over time, because I think naturally um, uh, you might, um, if you're not doing that day in and day out. Um, so just kind of uh, um, keep that in mind. I think the jobs that I offer were anywhere between like eight to 12 weeks uh, or like six to 10 weeks um, at the hub, which sounds like a lot. Um, and it, it is quite a bit, you know, it's like almost like a fifth of the year or like a sixth of the year. Um, but then also thinking like putting myself in that, in that position, oh, now I have to drive to this hospital that I've barely been in like most of the year. I don't know how to use their EMR. I don't know how to like get in touch with like to escalate to ECMO, you know, if somebody's crashing and just being like a kind of a, a fish out of water in, in a hospital that I've spent, uh, the vast minority of my time in, um, so there's a lot of like insecurity about that. So you just have to kind of be uh, thinking about those things and you know, making sure that you're okay with with that work balance. Um, but I think primarily you just know like my job is is the spoke, um, and that's and that's okay and that's kind of the intention. Yeah, and related to that Yoni, I think um, there's one job that I had briefly been negotiating with before I, I stayed in Chicago, and it was kind of the same thing with a few weeks at a different center, um, and I had that same thought of it was six weeks a year or something or something, and I would think I'm going to have to spend many years there before I know like know who's the ID person that I call when like the transplant person is doing well so I actually had briefly discussed the, the job didn't pan out but um kind of almost doing like a like a month or two kind of what Shashank did but just at that at that center because I didn't train there and kind of getting to know the people there um was was one option that um I'd heard it kind of out there and and to try and do that versus you know if I'd been asked to do a spoke at where I had where I, I stayed in Chicago um you know, like like Sarah's North this whole time like, for a long time. So if I'd been asked to do a spoke, I'd be kind of more comfortable going back and forth um because I, I I knew the, the system. So I think considering those options yeah. um, would be helpful as well. All right, one one more thing to add about spoke and hub. Just make sure that geographically the spoke and hub makes sense. Like I was offered a job where the spoke was like an hour and a half away from the hub. And I was like, where do I live? You know, it's like if I live in between my commute sucks like 100% of the year, if I live like close to one, then my commute is terrible, like 10% of the year, you know, so, uh, so just keep that in mind too, it has to like make sense for your life. Um, and uh, this one in particular, it did not make complete sense. So Tufts has a model that's similar to that, and they have people coming down from Dartmouth, uh, which is uh, a one way drive of like two hours, those people actually um spend a week at a hotel right across the street from Tufts and I don't think it's um uh, yeah I think they're slowly starting to quit but like you have to pick and choose what works for you yeah yeah keep those in mind again yeah like you know, I said it, it, or the, the Dartmouth example if if that's the situation though you also shouldn't be asked to be driving commuting two hours uh for those weeks on service so keep the geography in mind Oh um, yeah, the stay is covered and everything. But again, it it has to work for you, right? Like if you have kids that you're leaving behind, then that that's difficult. Um, so there are a lot more. I think a lot of questions been answered in the chat. I know not all of them. Um, Sarah had mentioned we're um looking. You know, we're excited that we got this engagement. Um, from all of you being here, uh, we're looking to build more. Uh, this year and kind of throughout the year, and um, with the HFC Early Career Committee, not just um 
events at HVSA, which we are planning many of these types of events uh, you'll hear about soon at the annual scientific meeting. So please come to that. Um, and then if you have any other questions, please feel free um, uh, to um, reach out to the panel and we will uh, do some more stuff soon. So I just want to thank everyone for being here, the panelists for taking their time uh, for preparing, and obviously, most importantly, um, everyone who came to, to learn and ask questions. I hope this was helpful, and we'd love any feedback.